Well, as I mentioned, we are truly living through uncertain times, but our greatest source of certainty is God's Word. But what is most important about the Word of God is what Jesus says about Himself. Because if Jesus is our salvation, if He is our way to the Father, then what the Bible says about Jesus is what is true about Jesus. If we truly believe who Jesus is, the person that he claims to be, then our lives will be defined by surrender to him. But not only that, it will be defined by a rhythm of surrendering to him. And one of those main rhythms is the surrender that we call the Sabbath. That's one of the topics you are going to see come out of the text this morning. We're at a point in John's Gospel uh, where if you've been with us, the Jewish leaders... Things have escalated quite a bit. They go from wanting to persecute Jesus to now wanting to kill Jesus, and they exert all of their energy plotting for ways to have Jesus killed. But something that triggers this escalation is that Jesus begins to heal on Saturday. And Saturday is the Sabbath day on the Jewish calendar or Jewish work week. And this is not the first occasion that Jesus will heal on the Sabbath. He heals, last week we saw that he healed the paralytic man. But when you get to chapter 9, you will see that he heals the blind man on the Sabbath. And so in the eyes of the Jews and the Jewish leaders, Jesus was violating the Jewish law. What is that Jewish law? That Jewish law is the classic Sabbath command. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 10, let me just read to you, and it's on the screen for you as well, what this Sabbath command is. And you could see, if you read very carefully, what it's meant to be, but you can also see how it can be taken to the extreme. And so this is the Sabbath command. God gave through Moses this command. And so in Exodus 20, verse 8, it begins, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor... And do all your work, but the seventh day, and that's Saturday on the Jewish work week, is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you should not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner, that's the visitor, who is within your gates. Now the the Sabbath command was built on God's created order. God created in six days, uh, and then he rested on the seventh. But here's the question. The Sabbath command was not given in Genesis. The Sabbath command was not given in the time of Abraham. The Sabbath command was given when? During the Ten Commandments, but when? It was given after 430 years of slavery in Egypt. The Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptian for 430 years where they had no real sense of Sabbath. So even now in the wilderness, they are not truly at home. They are sojourning. And so that gives you the context for the Sabbath command. Slavery had taken a toll not just on Israel's body, but on their souls. And the Sabbath command was given so that their souls could eventually catch up with their bodies. They needed spiritual renewal. Now the harshness of Egyptian slavery had created an innate trauma that became part of Israel's identity. Can you imagine? If you were to go to counseling for such trauma, you can't just go once. How do you do undo 430 years built into your history? Which means even if you're only 40 years old or 60 years old or 12 years old, this is the life that your parents were born into. This is the life that you were born into. As an Israelite child, there is no discussion about what do you want to be when you grow up. You know the answer. You're working for the federal government of Egypt. And it wasn't any federal government. It was a dictator. You're working for the Egyptians if you're an Israelite. And you're at the bottom of that workforce. You are a slave. So how do you undo 
430 years. How many of you guys been to vaca- been, on, been on vacation? Your body's supposed to rest. But you go on vacation and you do all kinds of things that make you tired. And when you come back from vacation, you need another vacation. What happened? Your body might have stopped working. You just simply stopped doing your career maybe for a week, but you still kept working. A lot of times you understand how you can sleep for an entire night, wake up and still feel unrested. Why? Because your soul has not caught up to your body. Your body might have slept, but your soul needs more than eight hours each night. So that's why it's not just one session of counseling with Moses. You're talking about an entire lifetime of a rhythm of retraining your soul. We blame Israel for not trusting God in the wilderness. They're stiff-necked. Why? Because they've grown up in these harsh conditions. They don't know how to trust. They don't know how to hope. They see a little glimmer of hope. They believe, and right away they start to question, is that going to be taken away? Are we going to be ushered back into slavery? They don't know how to dream. They don't know how to believe. So God says, you need every single week, your soul is going to be retrained where you don't have to be a slave. You don't have to work. You need a rest. And trust that I will provide for you. That's why your animals aren't working the farm either. You don't have to plant seeds. You don't have to water. You just allow the Lord to do the work. But it's more training the heart. Now, by the time we reach the New Testament, the Sabbath command had lost its redemptive purpose. Rabbinic tradition had added all types of legalistic rules, rules that are not found in the Scripture, and such is the case in the Gospel of John. So last week we saw a scene where Jesus healed this paralytic man, this man who could not walk for 38 years. But rather than praising God for a divine miracle, the Jews were blinded by rabbinic legalism. So in response to to the Jewish leaders, Jesus does say something. He makes shocking claims about his own identity, and that's where we are going to jump in. It is the claims that we're going to see this morning under our first point that cause the Jews to move from persecution to a desire for murder. So I've entitled our message today, Shocking Claims of Our Sabbath Redeemer. In the first part of our sermon, which is the longer part, we're going to look at these shocking claims. And in the second half, which is a shorter half, we are going to look at our Sabbath Redeemer. In the first part, we learn what we're supposed to believe about Jesus. In the second part, we are supposed to look at, or we're going to look at how we're supposed to live in light of these claims. If Jesus is who he really claims to be, then we must surrender. And part of that surrender is a rhythm of Sabbath made to train our souls. So point number one, or the first thing we're going to see this morning are his claims. His claims. What are these claims? If you have God's word, please meet me in John chapter 5, verse 16. John chapter 5, starting in verse 16. And the first claim that we're going to see is that Jesus claims to be the Father's equal. The Father's equal. Let me read to you now, starting in verse 16. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing things on the Sabbath. Verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Verse 18, this is, was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal with God. So you can see in verse 16, they accuse him of violating the law. But violation of the Sabbath is different from blasphemy. Violation of the Sabbath, they just condemn him and say, you know, if you keep doing this, there's going to be harsh penalty. But blasphemy would lead you to be stoned to death. So now they want to kill him because he's claiming that he's equal to God the Father. He's making himself equal to God. 
Essentially, Jesus claims to be God. And now, you and I, we believe that Jesus is God. But they didn't. They didn't understand who Jesus is. Now, if you jump to verses 19 to 21, I mean, this is very, it's, it's a pretty clear passage. There's a lot of words, a lot of verses, but the concepts are very clear. Verses 19 to 21. It says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Meaning, he's equal to God. Whatever he's doing is what God is doing. Verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. So all of these concepts, if you've been with us, we've explained how the Son is equal to God. The Son is sent from the Father. The, the Son knows the plan of God. We've seen earlier where Jesus says, I'm doing the work of my Father. Right? So we've explained all these concepts. And even this concept of life, it is life eternal. And that's why it is a life that can raise the dead. It is eternal life. Now, sometimes I go to the beach and I see these tandem bikes. I've honestly never ridden a uh, road one because uh, I am not coordinated. I'm clumsy. I'm clumsy. Even when I play basketball, those of you who know when I used to play, I fall down all the time. Right? And I think if my wife and I were to ride one, we'd probably get into an argument because I would not be able to do, do my part right. But these tandem bikes are these bikes for two people. It requires two people to pedal at the same time. Both need to work in tandem. But the reason I choose this illustration is because what Jesus is saying is that I'm pedaling, but actually my father is steering. You see, in a tandem bike, the person in front needs to pedal and steer. But the person riding the second person, all he needs to do or she is to pedal. And to make this illustration fly with the doctrine of a triune God, let's just say that the Father steers the plan of God. The Son is pedaling in wherever the direction that His Father is steering, and the Holy Spirit is the Ruach. The Holy Spirit is the wind that accelerates the work in the divine direction. And so what Jesus is in essence saying is that you Pharisees, are mad at me because you're saying that I'm biking in the wrong direction. But little do you know, the one that you call Father, He is my Father, and He's the one steering. I'm simply going along, and as He works, I work in tandem with the Father. And you guys think I'm going the wrong way, but the way you're headed, there is a firestorm coming. And unless you turn and go my way, you're going to face eternal judgment. So, the, so God the Son and God the Father work in tandem. And in verse 20, it, it, it's very clear that the Father has revealed His plan to His Son. And that's why uh, Jesus says, My, For the Father loves the Son, shows Him all that He's doing, and greater works than these you will see. What's the greater works? So, so people are marveling at His healing of the paralytic, uh, this, this man, 38 years, he could not walk, and, God, and Jesus says, rise and walk, and, and he's saying, there's going to be something greater. I am going to raise the dead, and that's what we see in verse 21. That's the, something that would cause people to marvel even more, the fact that Jesus could raise the dead. Now, the Pharisees, there's different sects of Jewish leaders. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. But the Pharisees only believed that God could resurrect people. So when Jesus starts to speak as if he can resurrect people, he's speaking, in essence, saying, I am God. And so once again, this is escalating the situation. Now, so that's the first claim that we, that we see that offends the Jews, is that he's saying he's the Father's equal. But the second claim 
is that he claims to be the final judge, that he is the final judge. Now, if you look with me at verses 22 to 24, let me show you where he, see, where he says this. And this is even a greater claim. Because here he says that he's greater than the Father in one sense of responsibility. Check this out. Verse 22, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Stop there. We believe Yahweh judges. He's the only judge. He's the Father, God the Father. And Jesus is saying the Father judges no one. That's, that responsibility of eternal judge has been delegated to me. That's really offensive. Because in essence, or in reality, the Jews are judging Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm actually the one who's going to judge you. You're judging me for violating the Sabbath. I'm going to judge you with the very law that you're accusing me of breaking. Now verse 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. That's the gospel. If you believe in Jesus Christ, His person and His work, and you believe that God the Father has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, then you will have eternal life, and you will be spared, forgiven. You will pass over the judgment and into eternal life, and you will not die forever. You will physically die, but spiritually you will come to life. So in verses 22 to 24, Jesus, claim, Jesus claims that he is the final judge. And he describes that the role of divine judge has been delegated from God the Father to God the Son. But there's another gospel reality that we see here when we read carefully. This is the beautiful tension that we see in the gospel, is that God saves us from God. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. God saves us from God. Wait a minute. Jesus just told us this. The Father's working, the Son is working. As the Father works, the Son works. As the Father will judge his own Son on the cross, the Son will work and bear that judgment. And that Son becomes the judge. In fact, the one who is going to judge us is the one who is the one who saves us, who believes in him. The very judge is the justifier. The, the very one who will judge is also the savior. There's this tension that in our small, finite minds, it's hard to cram this Jesus theology into our minds. Just as we, it's hard for us to understand how a, a person can be 100% man, yet 100% God. Yet in him, in God, the, in, in, in the divine son is the judge. In the divine man is our savior. It is amazing. And you begin to see these realities come across. It is God. It is the son of God who saves us from the son of God. But it is the son of God who also saves us from God the father. Now you see more in verses 25 to 26. It says, truly, truly. I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Now, Jesus here, he straight up refers to himself as the Son of God. But he switches identification. I'll show you in verse 27, but let's finish verse 25. He says, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So what I want you to understand in these two verses is that the Father has given the privilege of granting eternal life to his Son, meaning the Son is going to decide who gets life and who gets hell. And here, he's the Son of God because when Jesus sits in the seat of judge, he's the Son of God. But look at verse 27. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. This speaks to Jesus' humanity, his purpose for coming. Jesus becomes 100% man so that he can go to the cross to die for our sins. 
when he is our Savior, when we describe him as Savior, he's the Son of Man. When we describe him as judge, he is the Son of God. He's both. And read carefully verse 27. And he's given him authority to execute judgment. Why? Because. Why? How come not the Holy Spirit? How come not God the Father? How come not John the Baptist? Why is Jesus Christ given authority because he is the Son of Man? Because he, he died the perfect death. Because he went to the cross. Because he suffered. Because he's 100% sinless. Because he did the work. That's why he's qualified to be the judge. The reason why you and I cannot bear divine judgment upon other people, the the reason why you and I can't condemn people, because none of us are perfect, one. None of us are the son of man, but none of us went to the cross. None of us could offer the perfect sacrifice. That's why we don't have the right to judge people the way that God judges people. But Jesus has the right. Now verse 28 says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out to those who have done good to resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And when I read this and I see that Jesus is going to call people out of the tombs, I'm like, this is not the living dead. This is not some zombie TV show or movie. In fact, they stole that from Jesus. This is the Son of God. And here's the convicting reality. Many people in the world today will die not hearing the voice of the judge. Meaning, in this lifetime, they will never believe that eternal judgment exists. They will say, eternal judgment? That's funny. An afterlife? That's funny. Go ahead, Christians. Believe in eternal judgment. But I am my own judge. And when I die, I just die. And so what's convicting is, if you do not hear the voice of the judge calling you to himself, and you can't see that he's the Son of God, you will also not hear him calling you to eternal life after you die. If you do not hear the Savior calling you to eternal life here on earth, on the day of judgment, you will also not hear him calling you to eternal life. And you will come out of that grave and you'll be like, why am I being resurrected? Why am I being resurrected? I'm being raised? For what? For judgment. There's two resurrections when Jesus returns. There's the resurrection of the unbeliever unto judgment and the resurrection of the believer into eternal life. And that's the first main major movement of our passage, two claims that Jesus makes about himself, that he is the Father's equal and he is the final judge. Now, most of us sitting here or listening or watching, you believe those claims. But how do we apply those claims? And this takes us to understanding the Sabbath. Why is Jesus working on the Sabbath? I thought God rested. I, I understand that all things were created through Jesus, so the Father, Son, worked, and they rested on the Sabbath. So why is Jesus working? So the second, the second major point I want you to see is his Sabbath. So we've seen his claims, his shocking claims. Now we want to see his Sabbath. Now we're going to go back. I want you to go back to, to verses uh, 16 and 17. Let's do this first. Here's what it says. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he is doing things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. Right? So why are you working? Now, most of you would answer, because he's God. He's God. But that's kind of like a cop-out answer. It's a true answer, but what does that got to, how does that change your life? Right? Most of us believe Why is Jesus working on the Sabbath? Because he's God. Okay, go out these doors. Amen. But what implication does this have for our everyday life as Christians? And the answer to that application is understanding what Jesus is doing on a Saturday. Why is he working if 
The law says you're supposed to rest. Because there is a type of work that is supposed to happen on the Sabbath. Now, let me give you the bigger picture. God created man through his son. Which day? The sixth day. That's Friday. Then God rested on the seventh day. What day is that? Saturday. Man lived under God's rest. That was the original design. Man was supposed to enjoy God's work. That doesn't mean that that man doesn't do any work. But it it does mean that when, when they took care of the Garden of Eden, it wasn't supposed to be painful and there wasn't sin, there wasn't disease, there wasn't sickness, there wasn't people trying to steal your work. There wasn't that type of evil competition. Man lived under God's rest. But then man, Adam and Eve, fell into sin and work becomes painful. Work becomes difficult. Things become challenging. Fast forward, and the epitome of painful, sinful work is that God's people were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. When you put yourself Adam and Eve, under the submission of God's rules, you thrive. But if you reject God, you go under the rule of humans. Humans left to themselves create their own government and structures and their rules. You become a slave. It's a symbolic reality taught through real history. Until God delivers his people from slavery, after he delivers them, then the Sabbath command is given. And so this kind of goes back to our introduction. But here's the big picture. Those of you who are astute, oh, you know where we're going. If you were to ask Jesus, oh Lord, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Didn't you and your father rest on the seventh day? You could imagine Jesus saying, my father and I are working and we will not rest until our work is done. We will not rest until we can offer you true Sabbath. But we have the Sabbath command, but you're still enslaved to sin. We have the Sabbath command. You're still under the Romans. Every single time you reject the rule of God in your history, Israel, you've been exiled. You didn't want to listen to the good king. You wanted your own king. My father and I are working and will not rest until our work is done. We will not rest until we can offer you true spiritual Sabbath. Here's where we're going. John 19.30. You can imagine Jesus saying this. There is a day where Jesus rested. There is a day where he takes a temporary Sabbath. John 19, 30, on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. What's finished? The work. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The next few verses of John 19, 31 and 33 confirmed that he had to die before the Sabbath. Let me give you the next slide. It says this, since it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. And the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, They did not break his legs. Just a side note, that's why when I do the communion, um, and I don't think it's wrong to say this, but I never say his body that was broken for you. Body was never broken, okay? Uh, So I say, this is the bread that was, I I say something else, right? It's distributed for you. (laughs) Because the word of God says, in fulfillment of scripture, because the lamb had to be without blemish. A lamb with a broken leg, it doesn't qualify for atonement. 
So his body could not be broken. But the point I'm trying to make today is that he's already dead before the Sabbath. So Jesus does take a Sabbath. Jesus, when are you going to rest? I thought that you and the Father were working. I thought you guys created on six days. In six days on the seventh, you rested. Oh, follow me on this. What day did Jesus, what day did God create through Jesus humanity? The sixth day. What day was God recreating humanity? Meaning his death was necessary for the new creation to begin. Friday, good Friday. What day did God, the Father, and God, the Son, rest after creation? Saturday, the sixth day. What day does God, the Son, rest? Holy Saturday. But different from the Jews, Jesus rose. Jesus rose. You could put it this way. Jesus worked on Friday, rested on Saturday, rose on Sunday. Jesus worked on Friday, rested on Saturday, rose on Sunday. And so we understand why Jesus was working. Our Lord, the Son, didn't break the law. He fulfilled both the letter and the spirit of the law. He wasn't working on the Sabbath. He was doing what he had to do, which was a foretaste of recreation. And he fulfills the spirit of the law. When he goes to the cross, he's never violated the Sabbath. In fact, when the work is done, he actually takes a Sabbath. Healing on the Sabbath was a foreshadow of recreation. Can you see that? We don't know, like I mentioned last week, if this paralytic man ever comes to believe in Jesus. But this man needed healing. And so you see this recreative process. Remember, which day did God create man? Friday. But then he was recreating on a Friday. He rested on the Sabbath. But on the Sabbath, we're supposed to be restored. We're supposed to be recreated. And he's recreating. He's healing on the Sabbath. Later, he heals the blind man. Same thing on the Sabbath. So God worked until the sun said it is finished, the sixth day. Then the sun rested on the seventh. Let me give you the big idea in some application. The big idea this morning is that Jesus worked. And oh, he worked. He worked and did not rest until he said it is finished so that we could enter his rest and recreation, his recreation. Jesus worked and did not rest until he said it is finished so that we could enter his rest and recreation, his recreation. How should we understand the Sabbath command today? You see, the answer to that is by looking at the healing on the Sabbath. By healing the sick on the Sabbath, Jesus was giving this foreshadow of recreation, life-giving. He was giving us a foreshadow of what we should be doing on the Sabbath. We should be doing what Jesus did. That is not work. That is recreation. I want you to understand Sabbath today as a rhythm of rest and recreation, recreation. You call it recreation. I don't know where you learned that from. I read my Bible, and I see re-creation. So my question is, all of us know how to recreate. But when you recreate, do you get more tired? Or are you experiencing what it means to be recreated each time? Just a little bit. The sun rose on the first day. And as new creatures, we enter into his rest on that first day, Sunday. We honor the Sabbath by resting in Christ via his resurrection. And so our regular Sabbath, whatever you do on the Sabbath, it doesn't even need to be on Sunday if you have to work on Sunday. Some of you have to work on Sunday. 
We miss the point if we say we can't work on Sunday. What if you have no choice? But you find another day where you Sabbath. Some of you say, hey, it's Sunday. Does that mean I can't teach? I can't work? I can't cook for the sick? I, you can. The question is, whatever you're doing on your Sabbath, is it life-giving? Are you doing something that's life-giving for others? Are you being renewed? Are, is your soul being restored? Are you doing something that's life-giving like Jesus You see, are you entering into his rest? Are you entering into his Sabbath? Are you being recreated through your recreation? Let me give you a few examples. Worship, whether it's song and praise or coming here to pray, worship is supposed to be life-giving. What happens during worship is that regardless of what's going on, whether you're sick, whether you're struggling financially, you cease and be still and you begin to surrender to God. And you sing these songs. And maybe in the first stanza, you're like, I don't know if I believe right now because it's hard because I'm struggling. Or you might be like, I have a lot to praise God for. And you're being reminded that it's the Lord who blesses you. And what's happening to your soul, whether you can stand or you can't stand, is your soul through singing is being uplifted. And what happens should be a recreation, a type of recreation. It's supposed to be life-giving And then when you pray, you're drawing on that power of the Spirit. And when you fellowship, you might not have a lot, but maybe your friend has a lot of energy and they give to you. Maybe you don't have a lot of resources, but someone else's resource is blessing you and giving you life. As you're you're eating together, maybe not during COVID in here, but you're out there eating and, and enjoying each other. Are you getting tired? Or are you, rec- are you being recreated through that relationship? And you're experiencing both refreshment for your body, but also relational encouragement and refreshment for your soul. Fellowship ought to be life-giving. Hearing God's word, this is the word of God. It ought to be encouraging you, blessing you. And, and through the word of God, you are being remade each time through the creative word. <clears throat> Confession of sin through prayer and forgiveness. It's meant to be life-giving, renewing, and even your service for God, there is work involved. But if you're serving for your own recognition, then you're going to eventually get tired. If you're serving out of guilt or trying to pay back God, you're going to get tired. But if you're serving through your gifts and through the power of the Spirit, even when you're tired, you can be rested in Christ, the work involved, if your service is Christ-centered, if it's life-giving, then what you're doing is you're pouring out a type of recreation towards others. In closing, if we truly believe that Christ is who he claims to be, that he is the Father's equal, and he is the final judge, then our lives, your life, my life, will be defined by a rhythm of surrendering to him. Not just once. Because we have spiritual sin. Not just once. But every week, a rhythm of surrender. A rhythm of trusting. A rhythm of being recreated. Until he comes back and makes us whole. That's the resurrection life. We worship because he worked. We worship because he worked until it was finished. And our souls find rest in Jesus, our Sabbath Redeemer. We Sabbath because he suffered. We Sabbath because he suffered on our behalf. So everything that we do for the Lord, if it's going to be life-giving, it needs to be centered on Christ. So my charge to you, beloved, is learn how to center your rest in Christ and your recreation in Christ. Be recreated as a rhythm. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. And in the midst of a COVID pandemic, as well as everything else is going, that's going on in this world, Lord, our souls just see unrest. We truly need your rest. Father, maybe we haven't been through 430 years of Egyptian slavery like the Israelites, but we were born 
into spiritual sin, spiritual slaves. And even after you rescue us, Lord, we constantly need to come back to you so our souls learn to rest in you. Then we can work for you. Father, I pray, Lord, for anybody who is weary and tired that you would give their souls rest. For anyone who is physically sick, we know we have uh, members in our church that are recovering from illness and sickness. Father, we pray for both spiritual rest, but also physical recovery. Father, help us also in our fellowship and our service to experience recreation, recreation. Help us to find joy and peace in you. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus, our Sabbath Redeemer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.